Yeah, <laughs> the best solution. You will invite. I am waiting. He's the moderator. I was the organizer of this the workshop. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the session 331 uh, with the proposed questions, should we track illicit content through the DNS? I would like to invite uh, the organizer of the session, Professor Hartmann Glaser, which is one of the internet pioneers in Brazil is the Secretary General of the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. You are very welcome, Professor Glaser. Uh, my name is Thiago Tavares. I'm one of the board members of the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee and, uh, and Safe Internet Brazil President. And, and today, uh, we, we're going to have a, a very uh, interesting discussion, a very uh, hot topic that is, has been discussed in many forums such as ICANN and also uh, at the International Jurisdiction Policy Network. And uh, to introduce uh, the first round of this discussion, I would like to invite uh, two uh, distinguished keynotes to update us on the state of art of the discussions and provide some food for truth to our debates afterwards. It's my honor to ask Bertrand de la Chapelle Executive Director of Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network to take the floor for a short introduction on the global status of the Internet and Jurisdiction debate uh, on DNS and content. Please, Thank, Thanks, Thiago. Um, I have, what, 
25, 35 minutes, 40. <laughs> if, you could, if you could do it in 10, <laughs> I will really much appreciate that. That always is the, <laughs> the danger with Bertrand. No, that's okay. I will be, I will be careful. Uh, hi, everybody. I think it's better if I stand because I see people and you see, and you see me. Uh, so I'm Bertrand Lachapelle. I'm the executive director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. Among the three activities uh, and three programs that we have, there's one called Domains and Jurisdiction that addresses specifically the question that can be framed as follows. Under which condition is it appropriate to act at the DNS level to address activities or content that are inappropriate underneath? Uh, I see in the room a certain number of people that are following the work or even participating in the uh, in the contact group, and I want to just take a few minutes to, to highlight a certain number of issues that are related to this. First of all, why is it a relevant question? It is a natural tendency to think that, to make it simple, the domain name system is a wonderful uh, control panel. If you have a problem somewhere, wow, the problem is solved if you just flip the switch to take down the domain name, and it's solved, right? The thing is, a lot of people, and it is important to reiterate this, do not understand that when you suspend a domain name, the site is actually continues to be available. And the example that I took to explain that to somebody a few weeks ago is that if you're in a hotel, and I do not give you the address of the hotel, the hotel is still there. And if you have the GPS coordinates, you can still come to the hotel. So the GPS is the equivalent of the IP addresses, and the address is the equivalent of the domain name. So using the domain name as a tool is only reducing the ease of access to something. The second thing is, the second mistake that a lot of people make is that they use the expression to delete a domain name. And then, without getting into details, it's important to understand that when a domain name is deleted instead of suspended, it usually means that actually it is released again on the market. So you delete who was the owner, etc., but actually it can be used again. And so these are two elements that are very technical in nature, but that are often misunderstood. The next thing that I want to highlight that came very strongly in the, um, in the work of the group is the very coarse nature of action at the DNS level. Because if you take down or if you suspend a domain name, you basically impact a lot of other services. And in addition, it is something that is global. Because you cannot do the equivalent of GeoIP filtering that you do on a platform. If you suspend a domain name, it, of course, is applicable worldwide. So it is a very blunt instrument. And in addition, it prevents access and use to a lot of other services. So there is a fundamental question, which is, when is it a proportionate action to do something on the domain name when you want to address something that is at a lower level in the content or in the activity of the site? The next point that is important is where should those things be discussed? And for those of you who follow the discussions within ICANN, you know that this has been an ongoing discussion around the label of DNS abuse. And the question is, is this within the mandate of ICANN? Is it not within the mandate of ICANN? Is it within the mandate of ICANN? Is it not within the mandate of ICANN? Is it within the mandate of ICANN? Is it not within the mandate? Okay, you can continue on forever. And in as important as this question is, it prevents people from actually addressing the question. This is why the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network created this space that allows the different actors to go beyond just having sessions on this at every ICANN meeting, but without getting into the heavy process of a policy development process, which is at best premature and that a lot of actors do not necessarily want. And so I come to the last point, which is once we've said 
acting at the level of the DNS is a rough, coarse, and blunt instrument that cannot be used in all cases, that has potentially detrimental effects. It is not, at the moment, subject of a sufficient agreement within ICANN on how to address it. We nonetheless are confronted with the fact that there are situations where it is appropriate to do it. And so there are a few questions that I will not elaborate, but that are exactly the ones that we try to help the different actors access in the um, domains and jurisdiction contact group, which are, for instance, how do you define the types of abuses that need to be addressed? And here there's a distinction between the labels may vary, but there's a distinction between what is more directly related to the infrastructure in a certain way, botnets, malware, phishing attacks, spam potentially, if you put it in that category. And on the other hand, things that are more related to content. It can be copyright, it can be um, things relating to pharmaceuticals and, and sales of uh, regulated uh, substances. So this distinction is what is the threshold at which it becomes legitimate to act at the domain name uh, level is important. The other element is that what is the responsibility of the different actors when confronted with a notification regarding this? And who makes the notification? Is it a public entity or is it a private notifier? If it is a public entity, is it a public entity in the country of incorporation of the registry or registrar? Or is it a foreign court or a foreign um, authority? If it is a private notifier, what are the due diligence steps that this private notifier has taken? Is it something that the registry or registrar is recognizing? What are the steps? What are the formats? What constitutes good notice? What are the different components that should be in a request so that the registry or registrar doesn't have to make a full evaluation that they're in most cases not competent to make. And at the same time, what are the mechanisms that will allow the entities that want to act and do the right thing to act in a proportionate manner that doesn't overburden their activity and that is respectful sorry, of due process, procedural guarantees, etc. I stop here. It is a very important uh, topic. It's one of the three programs that the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network is facilitating. The two others are on content moderation on large platforms and cross-border access to electronic evidence. What is important to share here is that there are actually connections between the three programs and we are trying to make sure that the people from the domain name community are aware of the evolution of thinking on content moderation. <clears throat> and in particular, I can elaborate further if you want, uh, the notion of international normative coherence of illegitimate content. And likewise, are aware of the discussions that are taking place in the context of access to electronic evidence because there are some regulations that might directly impact the domain names um, operators, uh, in particular in regard to who is from outside of the um, uh, ICANN environment. So I stop with this. I could go on for, for ages, as Tiago knows. But um, it's a pleasure to have had the opportunity to introduce this. Before, and and don't, don't hesitate to go to the Internet and Jurisdiction uh, website to find the work of the remarkable people in the contact groups. Before I introduce the second speaker, we have some seats here in the front. One, two, three, four, five. You don't need to stand. Welcome. Now I would uh, like to introduce and invite Ms. Polina Malaya, Policy Advisor for the Council of European National Top-Level Domain Registries, to take the floor and also give us a short introduction on the European experience. Welcome. Some slides. 
So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for this introduction and uh, for this opportunity to have a, um, a short glimpse into European experience when it comes to the um, content moderation discussions on DNS level. And um, yeah, so I've um, prepared also a few slides for you. Thank you for getting them. I uh, hope you see them. Yes. And uh, yeah, so as I've said, um, uh, Center is an association uh, that uh, represents European country code top level domain registries such as .de for Germany, for example, or .eu for European Union. And um, uh, before um, giving a, a few examples on how European CCTLDs are uh, tackling this, uh, this topic uh, from their side, I would like to remind everybody that registries and uh, including CCTLDs are technical operators of uh, DNS infrastructure and uh, their responsibilities um, include operating uh, their DNS infrastructure for their TLD only, uh, organizing domain name registration process and maintaining the registry database. And all of that, uh, all of those responsibilities are there to make sure that uh, domain names can be used to navigate the internet. And um, before, um, Ah, yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so, and before we could even enter the, uh, uh, the topic of content moderation on DNS level, it is to, it's very important to establish a simple truth that registries have no control over content online. They uh, do not uh, host nor pass any content through their infrastructure at any point of time uh, within the internet traffic. And uh, this is an important uh, fact that um, yeah that needs to needs to be a, yeah is a foundation of all the discussions and um, the only action that registries can do uh, when it comes to responding in any way to content online is to suspend a domain name that Bertrand has also highlighted before and um, that means the domain name is taking down if yeah if I if I use another word for that uh, in in its entirety so as a whole and there's no way registry can um, only address a particular part of the website and uh, take down or remove content from the, uh, yeah, from the internet. And another important point about CCTODs is that uh, they are deeply rooted within their local rules and legal framework. Um, and uh, everything they can or cannot do is restricted within their local jurisdiction. And um, another important point is that an, many CCTODs are actually also governed as multi-stakeholder um, model. And uh, they regularly uh, consult their local internet communities, including governments and, and law enforcement authorities when revising uh, their policies. And um, they're also active collaborators on uh, many international internet governance fora, uh, for example, at uh, IGF. Uh, level um, and uh, yeah, being being active collaborators for discussions, sharing uh, their practices uh, with other also GTLD generic top level domain registries. Um, they're active within ICANN and uh, also participating in the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network that uh, Petron has outlined. And uh, it's also important uh, uh, to highlight that CCTODs are also considered to be an expert. Uh, within the local internet communities on, on technical issues and they pro regularly provide technical trainings uh, to governments and law enforcement and policymakers in general. And uh, before, um, yeah, so for so the second part of my intervention is uh, I would like to highlight a few notable examples um, from, from CCTLD uh, world when it comes to uh, tackling uh, this question of content moderation. And um, there are many, many more examples uh, because all CCTODs are different as I highlighted. Um, however, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll focus on three uh, that have chosen different approach. And uh, it's also important to bear in mind that uh, while there are successful approaches from the CCTLD world um, to, to many policies um, around, uh, around the topic, uh, just simply copying a policy from, from one jurisdiction to another would not, yeah, would, it does not guarantee a success, and it might, might not be even uh, legal in another jurisdiction. So uh, the first uh, example I would like to highlight today is uh, uh, Dataino, and um, 
Um, so it's a, a registry for uh, a registry for a country called for Norway, and um, um, the registration of domain names in, in Norway is uh, requires local presence and uh, also identification of a domain name holder. And uh, within a Norwegian uh, jurisdiction, uh, domain name holder is the primary responsible for the use of uh, domain name. And uh, the role of registry, and uh, that is the technical operation, has also been recognized by the Norwegian Supreme Court that has explicitly stated that uh, that in a registry does not undertake any control of the content of the website, nor does it have any mandate to react to websites that may appear to violate the law. And this is uh, this is an important uh, remit of, of, of the .no operator. Uh, however, Norit is actively collaborating with uh, law enforcement authorities and or or and other competent public authorities uh, to uh, make sure that there are. Um, reliable processes and procedures available for those who can assess whether uh, any illegal activity uh, has been um, conducted online. And the second um, example that I would like to highlight today is uh, the .dk operator, DK Hostmaster, um, an operator for a Danish um, country code. And um, Denmark um, has actually a legal framework that obliges uh, the registry operator to verify data in its registry database. And um, um, the national EID system is uh, used to verify uh, the data of the uh, domain name holders. However, um, DK Hostmaster is not looking into website content either. And if it takes action, that is uh, suspending a domain name, uh, they do it um, based on inaccurate registration data, and uh, that is in violation of their terms of service. And another interesting example is uh, .be, a uh, country code for Belgium. And uh, they have an interesting collabor collaboration procedure uh, with uh, the, their national government. And uh, it's an uh, interesting one because um, uh, it, uh, this procedure, so called Notice and Action Procedure, allows uh, the registry to, in cooperation with Belgium government, to act fast. Uh, against fraudulent usage of .be domain names. And uh, important characteristics of this procedure is that it can only, so the government can only uh, resort uh, to this procedure as a measure of last resort when it has exhausted all other means and has to actually provide proof um, if all of the means, other means are um, exhausted. And um, it is, uh, also includes uh, some liability guarantees for .be registry. Uh, when taking action uh, within, within this procedure. So DNS Belgium is not assessing whether something, has, uh, something illegal has happened or has not happened online. And this is left for the public competent authority. And uh, finally, uh, to... Yes, and, um, yes. and uh, so these are the three examples that I like, uh, wanted to highlight today. Uh, however, there are more and more practices, as I've highlighted, because all CCTLDs are very different. And uh, we have issued a, a published a central issue paper on that, and you can you can uh, check check it out yourself uh, by the link that is provided uh, just in the uh, bottom of of the slide. And uh, you can learn about other CCTLD experiences uh, within uh, and their role uh, towards online content. So. Finally, to respond to the two policy questions that have been uh, um, posed uh, to the panel, and I'm looking forward to the discussions afterwards as well. But from my side, uh, I'd like to just highlight that uh, blocking access uh, to illegal online content on the level of DNS infrastructure is not as effective as removing illegal content by taking action against uh, the owner of the hosting or the hosting provider. Simply because suspending a domain name does not remove content from the internet. So nothing will prevent content from moving to another domain name. So it, it's clearly not the most efficient way and should not be used as a first, first step when addressing uh, any harmful or illegal content. And uh, another point uh, I'd like to also say that DNS operators such as CCT, CCTODs are already uh, established uh, approaches and policies and practices within, within their own remit, within their own technical capacity to tackle these, these, uh, these problems. And um, however, registries cannot assess at any point of time and uh, they, 
they don't have, have capacity to say whether something is illegal or is not, and that should be left for the competent authorities to assess. And um, any misunderstandings on the role of the registries, and uh, including by equating them to the other actors within the internet ecosystem, will have detrimental consequences for actually many other stakeholders and users and businesses. And um, so this is an important uh, point that I wanted to, to, yeah, to highlight today, and I'm looking forward to the discussions. Thank you very much. Now I would like to move uh, for the second segment of this section and invite uh, four distinguished speakers to join us on this debate and address the first policy questions proposed uh, to this session. It's my pleasure to invite Manal Ismael. She is director of the International Technical Coordination Department at the National Telecommunications Regulatory Authority of Egypt and the ICANN GARC Chair. Uh, I, it's also, also a great pleasure to invite Thomas Rickett. Uh, he's an attorney, attorney at law, uh, director names and numbers, Eco Association of the Internet Industry in Germany. And it's also a great pleasure to invite Jennifer Schunk. She's Director of Corporate Knowledge for Dot Asia organization and oversee the knowledge and policy development for Dot Asia. And also, it's a great pleasure to invite uh, Miguel Inácio Estrada. He is the general manager of LAC TLD, the Association of Administrations uh, of TLDs from Latin America and Caribbean. And the policy question that we have. Uh, the first policy question to, that we have to discuss is blocking access to illegal content, illegal online content in the level of the NAS infrastructure as effectively as removing illegal content by taking action against the owner, publisher of the hosting providers. Who want to join, to jump in first? Thomas? Thank you so much, Tiago, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, in preparation for the session, I noticed that this topic of blocking access to illegal content has been haunting me for more than 20 years now. I'm not, no, I'm not sure whether that's a good thing, but you, some of you might remember that in the early days, we had discussions about what hosting providers should take down and what not. Then we had discussions about what access providers should be doing and how they should uh, limit access to certain types of content. Now we're talking about registries and registrars uh, taking action to, to tackle illegal content or the visibility thereof. So we're moving, moving closer and closer to the root. And I'm asking myself at what point we're going to go to ICANN uh, and ask ICANN to... Pardon? Root server operators. Root server, root server operators and, and ask, ask them to remove entire zones. So, joking aside, I hope that this is not going to be reality at some point, but there's a saying in Germany, and I hope that the translation will carry the idea, that for somebody with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if we're trying to manipulate the DNS, folks will easily use that, oppor that opportunity to shut down content that they don't want out there and don't even look for other things. And I think that uh, we need to take a far more nuanced look at the issues at hand and the policy or technical responses there, uh, there too. Uh, we need to take a look at what, um, what issue is at hand. Are we talking about uh, child sexual abuse material where um, uh, content that is online might be evidence of ongoing abuse scenarios? And by merely making that invisible by whatever technical means, we are potentially uh, taking away chances for law enforcement to step in and, and end the abuse, right? So, uh, so we need to take a look at what is at risk. On the other hand, it, it, we do know that for victims of, of abuse, it, it is particularly challenging to know that material depicting them is still out there and, and, vi and, and visible. Um, but that needs to be 
discussed differently than copyright infringements or free speech or, or other, uh, uh, other forms of content that might be objectionable to, to uh, some target groups. So I think that um, in all this discussion, I'm sure that we will get back to this, uh, we need to bear in mind that we need to take a look at what is the, the issue and what is the appropriate response. In Germany, actually, we had a law to limit accents by, by virtue of DNS blocking. It was put into force in 2010, and it was abandoned in 2011. It were, there was a big discussion um, in, uh, surrounding this, uh, and there was a plea by free speech advocates and many other groups who said, let's try to delete stuff instead of block blocking access to it. And, and if I may, Tiago, I've dug out um, a, a few figures, because if you take the trouble of trying to go to the company that actually hosts content, rather than to, uh, to prevent access to certain content at the DNS level or by other means of filtering or blocking, you can bring about change. So the, um, um, the BKA, our federal um, uh, police in, in Germany, has conducted, or they have published a report, and I have more information to, to substantiate this. Um, this is a couple of years old, but they, they looked at 143 websites. And instead of blocking, they went to the hosting, hosting providers and asked for a takedown, because most of that stuff is uh, violating their acceptable use policies or terms and conditions. So within one week, they had 68% of the websites uh, deleted. Within two weeks, they had 93% deleted. Within three weeks, they had 98% deleted. And after four weeks, it was 99%. So these are quite old figures. I have other statistics that I, can, uh, that I will happily share, but this is to, to show that if we take the trouble of manually going after bad content, if we channel it through the right, uh, uh, to the right uh, uh, organizations, such as law enforcement or hosting companies, then we can do both things, reduce the visibility of content and also help victims uh, and ongoing, uh, ongoing abuse scenarios. Thank you very much, Thomas. Manaus, perhaps you could be the next. Um, thank you very much, Tiago. And uh, before starting, I have to disclaim that I'm not speaking here for all governments, of course, and I'm not speaking for the GAG. It's not, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just sharing my own views from a governmental perspective. So um, um, I worked for a government throughout my uh, career path. I, 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 uh, I chair the GAC, so I understand somehow how governments uh, think. So just <laughs> not to be talking for anyone. Um, so um, just to uh, um, start here uh, by saying that of course, the, the illicit content is of deep concern to governments. And, and we have to um, agree that uh, governments would be looking for um, uh, quick, if not immediate, uh, action, uh, efficient way of taking this uh, content down. Um, and and um, and we'll be trying to do this one way or another. So and we have to appreciate that also in some circumstances this is uh, valid and, and uh, legitimate. And there was a, an excellent uh, session this morning on uh, um, addressing terrorist and, and violent extremist content online, um, and they were discussing the Christchurch. Uh, Call uh, uh, initiated by uh, New Zealand, and so uh, I'm just explaining that sometimes there are really legitimate, uh, uh, legitimate reasons behind uh, what the governments call for. Um, having said that, um, I still find some room for discussion. I mean, we can call for immediate actions, but we can still keep them reversible, for example, just in case we took the, right, uh, the wrong decision or have unintended consequences somewhere. We can ask for effective actions, but still, if they are proportionate, then it would be um, equally good. But I mean, if, if we just ignore the concerns and say it's not us, 
this doesn't help. And, and <laughs> I mean, governments will try to find one way or another <clears throat> to, to have uh, this issue addressed. Um, so I think we need to uh, put ourselves in, in other person's shoes and, and understands their concerns um, and have this dialogue um, ongoing. And at the end, if there is a process that needs to be followed, provided that it is um, efficient and quick, uh, I don't think anyone would uh, would not want to follow. And still, we need to find um, uh, some avenue for uh, exceptions. I mean, something like the Christchurch call. Uh, we need to have um, a fast track or, or, or somewhere where we can speed up even uh, this efficient process even further. Um, and... and I would say the internet and jurisdiction provided an excellent venue for starting this discussion. Um, I have to say also that um, I'm, I met a few parliamentarians here and, and I, I'm really very thankful for the uh, German government for inviting parliamentarians and for uh, bringing this very big number. I think they are 140 or 150. And I spoke to a few, and everyone was, everyone I met, I mean not everyone <laughs> from the parliamentarian, but the few I met were saying that this is an eye-opener, uh, the discussions here. And they, they, there's a lot to be learned, and they need to know more about this. So I think we also have a role in keeping those channels open and, and keeping everyone informed and updated so that we make sure that at the end what they come up with does not, uh, I mean, fragment the internet somehow or, or pose any unintended uh, consequences or, uh, or otherwise. So I, I, I'll stop here and give others the chance. I didn't want to give you the short answer to the question, so <laughs> I'm sure you're looking for a discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much, Manal. Uh, Miguel, perhaps you could be the next okay. and give an update on what's the discussion. Okay, in I'll, give you, I'll give you the short answer. The answer is no. So you can, no, no, it's not effective. Uh, there's a, a, a big risk of having undesired impact when taking down a domain name. As an example, uh, if, you've, if you as a, a registry are somehow uh, looking into the uh, content of uh, your domain names and you find uh, phishing, you decide to take down that domain name uh, because there's a web page doing phishing, and maybe the owner of that domain name doesn't know that there's a web page on their website doing phishing. So you're going to be taking down a whole business uh, without the, 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 the responsible for that content knowing what happened. If you take down a domain name, uh, they can easily, uh, the, the ones behind that, uh, that domain name, they can easily use another domain name. Uh, and if not, they can, the domain name will still be available use, uh, using the IP address. So it's like blocking the sun with a hand. You cannot do that. Um, you're making, uh, also, you're making aware they're responsible for the illegal content, if we are speaking of the Ill illegal content, that you have an eye on them. So if they want to go back, legally speaking, they could go back with a better website and more difficult to take down because maybe they can start uh, complying to the reasons you, you gave to take down the domain. So the solution is to find the responsibles. Uh, if you can't find the responsibles, you go for the, for the one who's ho hosting that, uh, that content. That would be the hosting company, so whatever. Uh, we, from and luckily, we, we held a, in August this year a workshop where we invited um, judges, prosecutors, LAEs, and also platforms and brand owners. Um, what su surprised me most in that workshop is that brand owners uh, were telling 
that they were tired of asking judges to take down domains because they will have to do for the first time and then a second time and then a third time and the same person will be behind that domain name. So they are wasting time and they're wasting money. So uh, what they intend to do, and that's wh uh, why they were there, is to give tools to, the, to judges and prosecutors and LAAs to find the responsibles, not to just block the sound uh, with your hand. And I don't know if I have any other point, but I don't think, I don't want to forget anything, sorry. Uh, well, well we, we know that maybe some content might be treated with uh, more, more urgently than other content. But if you want the, uh, the content to definitely go offline, you will have to take the content offline, not block it. Uh, and as Bertrand said, uh, deleting the address from the guide won't take the house from the street. So it's kind of the same. Thank you very much, Miguel. And then I invite Jennifer to give us a perspective from the Asia Pacific area. Thank you, Tiago. Ooh, this is on? Okay. So I don't want to echo what my colleagues have already said on, on this panel, and the short answer really is no. Uh, recalling what Paulina said earlier, I mean, registries op operators do not and cannot be uh, responsible for or, or able to take down any kind of content. And what uh, Thomas said is really correct. You can't use the bluntest, most strong tool to do something for example, if there is um, illicit content on an otherwise um, legitimate website, there's no way for any registry operator to kind of surgically remove bits and parts of it. There's no way for that to happen. It is what Bertrand did mention before. We can only suspend it, hold it, and in other words, it can, we can remove it from the view, but then if you have the IP address, you can still see it. So what really can be done um, about this? We're not really talking about the effectiveness of really um, targeting this thing when you have to really go to the hosting providers, the publishers of online content, the people who can actually get to ch altering, changing, deleting this content rather than going all the way up the hierarchy to, to use such a tool. Um, you know, there was a joke earlier about you know, go all, going all the way to the, to the root servers, which is really, that's, that's not desirable in any way, shape, or form. But there's also the question is, you know, I think Paulina also mentioned, you know, even if a registry takes down, for, for example, um, a, a, TL, um, a website, the content can then jump to other fora. They can go from TLD to TLD, websites to websites. So what really, what is actually um, um, done in the sense when you, when you go to a registry operator and say, you, you need to do this? Maybe it's because it's easy for them to identify, okay, well, maybe, our information is out there for people to see, but then when you think about it on a deeper level, you're not really addressing the actual problem. You can't use something that is so blunt and you know, to borrow Miguel's face to use your hand to cover the sun to pretend that this problem has gone away when it comes up again in different things. And I guess maybe I will just share a little bit about um, what recently happened. There are some protests in certain parts of the world where you know, there's illegal things happening and personal data is posted online publicly. This is also commonly known as doxing. So what happens? This is not really kind of a DNF abuse in the technical senses. Of course, it is you know, content abuse in the privacy sense. When those websites get taken down, they get to you know, move to different sites. You know, should registry operators care about this? We cannot do that in, in our framework, but should we have information sharing or digital fingerprinting on these things? This can be, I guess, further discussed and developed, but you know, going back to the short answer, Tiago, I think I will have to agree with everybody up here that it really is not an effective use to do that. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Now I'd like to take uh, two interventions, one uh, from remote participants and another one from, from you guys. And before we move for the second policy questions. No remote participation? Okay. Does anybody want to take the floor? Yeah, there is one gentleman. Uh, 
please introduce yourself. Oh, hi. Hi, I'm uh, Jack from Assembly 4 from Australia. I think the main thing that I guess everyone is worried about is what is illicit content? Um, and this differs by jurisdiction. Um, I was just in the uh, internet splinter, splinter net um, panel just before, and um, given that it's hard, especially for registries, if um, someone registers a domain, the uh, DETLD, presumably that's due to, uh, that is covered under German uh, legal uh, German laws, but why not? They, why wouldn't they just move to another registry, where with much more freer laws, right? And again, I feel like it just doesn't help, especially for example, uh, the U.S. passed uh, Foster Sesta April last year, which uh, criminalizes anything seen uh, as sex trafficking. And given that the U.S. doesn't really have any form of uh, legal sex work, that effectively caused a lot of um, uh, platforms that supported sex workers around the world to disappear overnight, which put sex workers in more harm. So I guess legality is different for jurisdiction, and it's a slippery slope to, I guess, a more, I don't know, less free internet, I suppose. Thank you. Petra? Yeah, actually, it's, it's a good thing to intervene after, after that, because it's part of what I wanted to say. Uh, as the others have said, yes, the answer to both questions is no. The question is, what do we do once we've said no? We can exp continue to explain why it's not the best thing, but is, it, is there something better that can be done? Where can we go next? And there are a few things. One is that we all understand that this is a problem we have in common. And I'm sorry to repeat it over and over again. I'm using this in almost any intervention. We keep arguing about all those issues about applicable laws on the internet and so on as if it's always the responsibility of somebody else. It's either the government saying to companies, you don't do what you should be doing. It's your responsibility. And the companies say, you're putting too many regulations on us. Is this proportionate? And civil society, and apologies for those who have already heard the joke, they usually say governments and businesses, I don't like when you are behind closed doors and you do things on our back. So fundamentally, the challenge that we have and what we're trying to do is to bring people around the table and say, okay, we have a common problem. And the common problem is, and it has been mentioned indirectly, what are the different actions that are necessary along the whole chain of accountability? You have a user posting something on either its own website that he has bought the domain name or on somebody else's site that can be a platform. This is hosted by a hosting provider. And they have other actors we have not mentioned, the cloud flares of this world, the Akamai, the people who are replicating this, the cloud service provider. All these actors are part of a common problem, which is how do we collectively, as a society and all the different actors, collaborate and coordinate to weed out the things that we collectively consider as inappropriate. I don't think anybody considers that phishing is a good thing. How do we combat phishing? What is the different responsibility of the different elements in the chain? We're talking about reaching the user. This is a whole problem that you know is addressed and, and is under discussion on the whole who is thing, but there's a notion that has emerged in some CCTLDs, which is the notion of reachability of the user. You can protect anonymity. You can have proxy uh, registration. The question is, is the individual person in the end potentially reachable through sufficient legal steps? And there are other issues that I just want to, to touch very quickly on. Is the law of a country where a registry or registrar is incorporated, applicable to all the content that is activated under a domain in this. In other terms, is every site under .com supposed to respect American law? Because you bought the domain name under .com, or through a registrar in the US, 
There was a case, and I encourage you to, to look at it, many years ago, that was called Rora Directa, where basically the domain name was seized, although it was a European uh, entity, because the domain name had been bought under a registry or registrar in the US. Another question is, if a registry or registrar wa receives a notification from a court, very legitimate order, from a foreign country, should this registry or registrar only operate under a court order of their own country or not? These are very valid questions, and they're not a simple answer. So I just want to encourage all of us to say, once we have all agreed, and I completely agree with everything that has been said, that no, it's not the right place. As I said in the introduction, there are still cases where it is the right place because of urgency, because of the egregious nature of the content, child abuse being one, but there can be others. What, can he, what is the chain of responsibility? What, is the cooperate, what are the cooperation mechanisms that can be put in place so that when problems arise, they are tackled at the right level with the right procedures to actually reach the people who are doing the harm and not necessarily use the chain as the main target because it's simpler. But this is a common problem. And the DNS is one component in the whole thing. And there are many aspects that are related to the type of content that is internationally unacceptable or only very locally unacceptable. Thank you so much, Bertrand. And now uh, uh, I turn over to Professor Hartmut Glaser to introduce uh, the second policy question that was proposed for, for this session and to uh, coordinate the debate since from now. Please, Professor. So let me introduce the second question. <clears throat> Ready? Take, take note. <laughs> if DNS operators have any role to play, should they bear the same responsibilities as hosting providers? and publishers of illegal content, or should they have a different legal treatment? What are the risks inherent to a one-size-fits-all approach to the matter? Manal, you start. <laughs> you sit on my side, so it will be easier for me to give Learn not to sit by your side next time. <laughs> so, um, so um, to, 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 to the first question, I would ultimately say no, but with the condition I, I, I mentioned before. Um, moving to the second question, um, I don't, of course, see the same, since we agree that it's no for the first question. Uh, I don't see the DNS operators playing the same role, of course, as the, um, uh, as the hosting providers or publishers uh, of the illegal content. Uh, but again, I can see a role for them, uh, at least in, um, as I said, you cannot just say it's not us and, and leave it as this. Um, you have to find an, an alternative um, avenue um, that would accommodate the concerns of the governments. And I'm sure if you tell them, if you go to the uh, hosting provider or uh, the publisher, uh, this guarantees more effective uh, results because the, the content will not be put elsewhere. Uh, this would be uh, more efficient because it's the shortcut to, uh, to the publisher. Um, otherwise, even if the operator wants to help, they will contact the, um, the hosting provider, and this would even take more time. So if you're providing um, an alternative that is more quick and more efficient, I'm sure no one will say no. But if we just ignore and say, you don't understand, it's not us, we have nothing to do with this, then I'm sure they will try to use the hammer. <laughs> 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 so 
don't try to look like a nail. <laughs> so no, jokes aside, I'm just I'm just saying that we have we have to appreciate the concerns and and they are valid and legitimate and and we had very good examples this morning. So just trying to find a, a common way forward and accommodate uh, uh, the concerns as possible. And I can see the dialogue is, is, is progressing in the, in the right direction, I would say. Let's follow ladies first. Jennifer. Thank you, Hartford. Oh, it's on, okay. Um, so I don't think we can say no and then just wipe our hands of everything. I think, of course, registry operators and you know DNS operators, registrars as well, um, we've actually taken it on. A lot of registries and registrars have taken a very good faith approach to try to come and discuss it. And actually, you know, two weeks ago, I see a lot of colleagues in this room. We met in Montreal at the ICANN meeting to talk more about what you know DNS abuse is and how we can kind of come together to to come to a common like information sharing uh, um, framework to be able to tackle it. I don't think that oper DNS operators should bear the same responsibilities because we aren't, you know, we aren't in control of the content. And I think I don't need to reiterate what we were talking about in the, in the previous segment of the discussion. But um, we are also intermediaries. You know, we are not, you know, the arbiters of the content. We don't want to be judged during an executioner. When we have a court order, of course, from different jurisdictions, as Bertrand pointed out, it is much, much easier to take this piece of paper saying, okay, it came from a court. We have this, you know, this uh, right or, or this obligation to act because there's a court order. A really interesting thing that you pointed out was different jurisdictions. Now, Dot Asia is, you know, um, we are at TID, like we're headquartered in, in, in Hong Kong, but we do receive lots and lots of different court orders from courts around the world. A lot from the US, of course, but you know, we do look at it, we do act upon it, and it is in, within our uh, anti-abuse policy to, to, to act upon it as with, with sole discretion. Um, that being said, you know, a lot of this does come on the technical abuse, right? That, if it affects the integrity, stability, and security, of the TLD, of the registry, then of course we need to act right away. When we come to content, as I think a lot of the panelists have said, and also the question um, from the floor, there's a sliding scale here. What jurisdictions are we looking at? What kind of norms? What kind of cultures? I think really what we're trying to do here is to get the most information to the people who can act upon it to create this informa information sharing that we can then uh, take it forward, whether it is cooperating, of course, with the law enforcement um, authorities, uh, within different ju jurisdictions, regional ones, and of course, amongst ourselves, the registries and registrars, you know, sharing this, this information is actually really crucial. So I'll leave it here. Thank you. Now, M Miguel, it's your time. Okay. Uh, so my answers are no, no, no. Again? That is the most negative intervention in a panel I have ever had in my life. So let's go to the next. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is no, at least in the, in the way some expect. Uh, uh, we are part of the logical layer of the internet, so again, we have no responsibility or entitlement to inspect content. So that, that's not the idea. Um, I know, would you ask the uh, RIRs to go through every each one of the IP addresses to search what's behind them to see, and see what's illegal or not? I, I don't think so. So we shouldn't do that. Uh, I think our responsibility is to collaborate, collaborate and be responsible with the uh, information requests uh, from authorities and educate authorities in what information are we able to provide because that is something that usually happens uh, where for example I don't know dot something cctld is asked for information on dot com or, or whatever um, and also make them aware of the risks when they decide to finally take down a, a domain name um, uh, 
from like TLD, we, uh, again, we held uh, uh, an, an illegal content workshop in Bogota in August, where we invited, uh, again, <laughs> judges, prosecutors, and LAAs. And we had a, a, a day where we trained them on the different uh, layers uh, I can identify from the internet, the infrastructure layer, the logical layer, and the uh, economical or content layer. So they can identify what, uh, what kind of infor information they can expect from each one of the actors in those layers. And what we find during this uh, workshop is that uh, mostly platforms, hosting providers, and everyone acting uh, at the content layer were really collaborative with them and were really eager to collaborate because they don't want to uh, have that content within their platforms. So if each one in each capacity, in each layer collaborates, everything's gonna be better. And again, we're gonna be finding the responsible for the illegal content and not just blocking the sand with the hand. You said it was an illegal workshop? Illegal content. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thomas, please. Yeah. Um, I think I'd like to get back to my earlier point that we, that we need to take a very nuanced look at what we're trying to solve and who can solve a particular issue. Um, we've heard the registry and registrar perspective. Uh, I spoke a little bit about the ISP perspective. I think we need to note that registries and registrars have a binary choice to make, either to make a domain name work or to suspend it from from working uh, through di different technical means. An ISP can actually take a more nuanced approach to things, even at the DNS level. We've seen this, I guess, the, the first, the first uh, precedent for this was in the UK many years back with, U with BT Clean Feed, where you, you could filter at the URL level even, right? So that is possible. And I think we need to take a look at what is the infringement that is alleged, what is the, the good that is to be saved or preserved. And then for, for certain types of abuse, the registrars and the registries have something in their AUPs and their acceptable use policies, and they will likely take, take action. Or they check the registration data for the registrant, spot that the data is inaccurate, and then suspend the domain name because of that, and not necessarily because of the infringement that they can't really comment about. Right? For ISPs, they, it, it's even more different because they don't entertain a contractual relationship with the, with the holder of the domain name. And in, in Europe, we have, uh, uh, we have laws that specify who is responsible for content that they generate themselves and publish themselves for content that they host for, for others. And then scenarios where they are the mere conduit, where they just uh, offer the line, basically, for, for third parties. And for that, and I'm, I'm sort of proud to say uh, that the first crack at that came from Germany with the Information and Communication Services Act. Uh, 1996 it was made, and then in 1997 it was, uh, was put into force. And that was basically copied into the e-commerce directive at the European level way back when. But we're now on the verge of eroding this, this scenario where mere conduits can't be liable for, for, for third-party content. So we're, we're sort of reviewing this at the moment, and there are changes on the way, and there are political demands sort of to, to, to change that. And I think that's, very, uh, that's a very dangerous thing to do. And there has been something by, at the European Court of Justice where these, these web blocks have been tested. And basically, in, as a matter of last resort, so the court said, both at the European level as well as in, in Germany, as a matter of last resort, resort, that can work. And you need to balance uh, what rights are at stake for the internet service provider whose right to, to, to choose their profession, which is embedded in our constitution, is at stake. The right to, in, uh, to information and self-determination self is at stake. Uh, the telecommunication secrecy is at stake. Uh, so you need to take a look at all those rights. And in exceptional circumstances, courts can issue blocking orders. Right? But this is to say, and I'm, I'm going to, uh, I think I've exhausted more, the, uh, more than, than I have in terms of time, 
we need to take a look at who does what and who has the best angle on that. It's, it's not good to just shut down a domain name and thereby, as collateral damage, shut down websites that are perfectly legal, right? So, um, and I, I think in the political debate, I'm missing that somebody wants to take the trouble and look at roles and responsibilities and who can do what. You know, going to ICANN and ask ICANN to do things that are outside ICANN's missions is, is a no-brainer. Going to, to a registry and ask them to police content that they don't have any influence on is a no-brainer. But everybody can play their respective roles. And I think we need to map that out. And, that, and it all needs to be a constitutional process, a due process, when content is taken down. You know, it can't be done in hiding. That's uh, maybe the most important message. Paulina, you like to mention or comment? Yeah, please. Yes, I, I think I just want to echo exactly what uh, my you know, uh, co-panelists have said. And um, I think the really important part is to really understand the, what a role registry plays within, yeah, within the ecosystem. And then we could see like what they can do and in which circumstances. And it's not about shielding ourselves from, no, we cannot do anything and don't come to us. It's just come to us when you really exhausted all the measures, when there is imminent threat to, uh, to, uh, yeah, to consumer interest, for example, collective consumer interest. When, when, and I think another important part about uh, suspending a domain name, I think it can be considered to, to, can be compared to like a, a to a nuclear measure to respond to to uh, to uh, illicit content and um, so I think also the question of uh, reversibility of the action is should, should should also be on the table because um, what if it's going what if it's done by mistake and this is why the role of a public competent authority is there who can assess who can really say okay you're taking this 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 great action of taking down the whole thing suspending entire domain name. And I think it can only be done in exactly emergency cases when there is no possibility to address it at the source. So I think this is just an important part that needs to be uh, considered within this debate and not just equating all the stakeholders and uh, considering that they have all the same responsibilities and have the same control over content. And, uh, Before I ask the audience, let me ask Bertrand for his comments and then we go to the audience. Thank you. <clears throat> Usually when I, when I work on the, all those issues, I like to take the devil's advocate position, arguing for one category of actors in front of others and vice versa. One thing that is, and it's striking me as we hear the, uh, the, the exchange here, <clears throat> one of the big difficulties of the registries and registrars is that they have to work on two fronts. And those two fronts are very difficult to reconcile when you speak publicly. On the one hand, the level of misunderstanding of the technical aspects forces to overemphasize the, no, we cannot do it. This is not technically what is supposed to work. Meanwhile, the vast majority of them are actually doing stuff. They're addressing the technical abuses particularly botnets, malware. And I want to emphasize what was said just in passing. The question of when something is compromised is a very delicate thing. And they pay a lot of attention to understand how to tell the person, the registrant, which is the person that has to be protected, because it's actually their site that has been hacked sometimes, that they can work with that. The problem with content is that there is an increased pressure at the moment that is coming. And so on the one hand, they have this difficult position of having a very strong message that says no, just to explain that it is difficult. And at the same time, if they begin to say, but we are doing a lot of good things, then the whole door is being pushed and, and oh, but then you can do other things. That being said, as I said before, there are things that have to be discussed because at the moment we do not have the solution. One example is, <clears throat> Somebody was mentioning the, the situation of, you have an online pharmacy in one country, perfectly legal in one country, but they bought the domain name from a registrar in a completely different country. And then the registrar in this second country receives a notification for a third country that says, you know what, pharmacies are illegal in my country, and this one has not authorization. Let's say it's a pharmacy in India and the requesting country is Japan. 
how are we going collectively to address the thing that there might be a distinction between this website is entirely in Indian languages for the population of India, doesn't sell abroad, doesn't sell any prescription to anybody outside of India, and even says it explicitly on its site, versus exactly the same domain name where the operator is actually providing a web page in Japanese, sending pharmaceuticals in Japan, has no authorization there, and has refused three times or four times to comply with the request to not deliver things in Japan. That's the kind of very difficult issues that we're confronted with. And the expression last resort has been used. It is manifest that in the first case, it's absolutely inappropriate to suspend the domain name for something that is fully legitimate in India and is not serving any other actor. On the other hand, if there are three strikes, whatever, and there's manifest ill will, maybe it's a last resort measure to suspend temporarily or things like that. But asking the DNS operators to make proactively this kind of, of, of research is certainly not appropriate. And I like the, the comment saying we're not asking the, the original internet um, registry uh, to check every single IP address is a very, very nice uh, pun. There is a sliding scale from the editors who have full responsibility of everything that they're posting, including the owners of a website, to the upper end or the other end of the chain where the responsibility is technically and morally and operationally completely different. We need to discuss what is appropriate to be done at each, uh, at each stage. And I want just to insert one last thing. On the content aspect, in the content and jurisdiction uh, program, there's a notion that is emerging, which is, I mentioned it earlier, international normative consistency. Very quickly, four categories. There are types of content that everybody in the world considers inappropriate, and the standards are relatively or quite similar, child abuse material. Second category, everybody agrees it has to be addressed, but the standards are different, defamation. Third category, not everybody agrees, but due to local circumstances, <clears throat> some content can be considered illegal, denial of Holocaust in Germany or in France. And fourth category, not only is there no agreement, but there is also, there's even a strong disagreement because some countries consider that the legislation of another one is, shouldn't exist. Sexual orientation, discrimination, uh, racism, uh, whatever. If you think about those four categories, you can couple it with the notion of geographically proportionate restriction. And because, to finish, because a domain name suspension is not only blunt for all the services, but it's viscerally and structurally global, it is only if you meet the highest standard of international normative consistency and high level of proof that it makes sense to act. And this goes to the due process mechanism of how you establish the fact that it is indeed infringing globally that will trigger that sort of thing. But these are the discussions that we should have together. Thank you. Is there a remote? I will go to the audience and I will ask you, please uh, say your name. It can be a comment or can be a question. So you please, very clear. Uh, let's start here with my friend from Russia. He was the first. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Hartmut. Uh, Leonid Todorov, APTLD for the record. Well, uh, first of all, thank you. That was quite illuminating and uh, I was happy that everyone was on the same page. I uh, just uh, would uh, reference to the Manila principles. I was trying to uh, find out if there is any government or new government as a signatory to the document and I didn't find uh, any. So my question is, uh, how soon do you think governments would be uh, uh, in a position to appreciate Manila principles and validate them or codify them. Uh, that's one question. And the other question is like, uh, listening to everyone, I realized that uh, at times we seem to be living in uh, different worlds or universes, if you will. 
Uh, because for some of uh, our members in the EPTLD world, imagine a situation when uh, the same registry is uh, the registrar, the only registrar, and also the one and only ISP. And on top of that, uh, as and this is a real, uh, real life case, uh, the Ministry of uh, IT or whatever is at the same time the Prosecutor General for the nation. <laughs> so my question to the panel, uh, would you suggest any kind of universal remedy for those small guys, usually, uh, you know, landlocked or island-based uh, uh, registries, <laughs> Uh, dash registrars, dash whatever. Uh, is there any, any universal remedy or a, any universal answer they com may come up with when they're, min uh, oh, yeah, on top of that, they are all public entities, you know, I mean, not private. So when their minister slash uh, prosecutor general uh, comes with a question as to what to do with whatever request for domain name suspension or deletion. Thank you. The lawyers normally have answers for every question. Well, I, I, I'm afraid for the first question, I don't have an answer. So I, I can't really uh, give you an informed guess as to what, uh, what and when it's going to happen. I think the, the, um, the um, organization that sort of performs all roles um, as a one-stop shop, including the, the public side of things, uh, I mean, this happens, but you, you find other companies that also perform more than one role. And I think that you really need to specify um, the, the responsibility per role. And then, as, as you typically would, you try to find the least eva invasive measure. I think when it, when it comes to the, um, um, the prosecutor general um, instructing you know, the person sitting next door that's responsible for managing domain names, that would be sort of an odd case. And I, I would hope that uh, that you find more due process um, uh, in, in, in such a such a country. I mean, we're we're discussing um, uh, approaches and jurisdictions that try to do their best in order to come up with constitutional approaches, and the the situation that you describe doesn't seem to be amongst them. So I think that that's um, that's a that's a challenge in itself. I think what the the only thing that we can ask for is ask for due process and ask for. Uh, all solutions that are that are being discussed not to be voluntary or handshake agreements, but they are, that they are founded in applicable laws. Uh, let, you, let me give you one brief example. It's only going to take a few seconds. Many years back, at the beginning of the 2000s, in a European country that shall shall be uh, shall rename um, shall remain unnamed. It's not Germany. I should confess. There was an arrangement between internet service providers and law enforcement whereby law enforcement would send lists of websites to be blocked to the ISPs, and the ISPs would then implement uh, uh, filtering or blocking technology. And there was overblocking, so somebody complained and went to the ISP and said, well, my website doesn't work, so why is this? And the ISP said, well, we take this uh, filtering list from law enforcement on an as-is basis, so you better go talk to them. And the police said, well, we just gave you this as sort of um, inspiration for, uh, for feeding your filter, so we, we didn't give you this as, as, a, as a legally binding order. So that's what we want to avoid. It needs to be due process or contractual. You know, you can have your AUPs and ask your customers to play by certain rules, and if they don't, you kick them out. That's ha that happens in business everywhere. But we, don't, we should resist the temptation of being forthcoming and doing some shady arrangements with public authorities, but rather wait for court orders or other things that can be challenged in, 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 the, in, the, in the courts. Thank you. We have two other questions he here in the middle. Yes. <laughs> Then we have on the other side, let's see the time. We have five or six minutes. Already. I'll hurry. Hello, everyone. My name is Sebastian Schwemer. I'm a researcher at the University of Copenhagen and for the last three years had a research project uh, in collaboration with the Danish uh, CCT registry, uh, DK Hostmaster. In my research, I've been looking at a lot of these questions. So a liability exemption regime of the e-commerce directive in uh, whether and how uh, registries fit under that. 
uh, trusted notifiers and also what the contractual practices, uh, especially the 30 CCT European CCTDs, where actually one third has some kind of content and abuse related uh, notion. Um, and from a legal research perspective, I agree with the very many no's I hear here today, and I think that's important, the clarification on technical abuse, content abuse, etc., also in a view of the upcoming European revisions, potentially. Um, but then there's this one thing um, about um, all the measures that are actually being taken in place. And I think one aspect which could be interesting to look more at is uh, platforms that have those practices in place. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about transparency, and I would much like, from a research perspective, to see the similar discussion in terms of uh, what registries do, because things are happening, but uh, trusted notify models are really difficult to get content on, and they're being discussed in uh, many different places right now. So maybe the panel has some thoughts on that. Thank you. Any comment? Okay. On the last row. And then this lady on the other side. Yeah, hi. Um, my, my, my name is uh, Gabe Levitt, and I'm the founder of a company called Phar PharmacyChecker.com. And I'm also founder of a nonprofit group called Prescription Justice. And online pharmacy is a very big topic. Um, and Bertrand brought it up, and I was a little bit intimidated to ask a question, but then he brought it up, so I had to say something. Long story short, there are um, tens of millions of people in the US who um, don't fill their prescriptions because the drug prices are too high. And there are a subset of safe international online pharmacies, often based in Canada, uh, sometimes based in other countries that are working with licensed pharmacies and Americans import lower cost prescription drugs from those uh, pharmacies using a website. They help, have helped millions of people. Then there are lots of rogue sites, and Bertrand alluded to this problem of rogue sites and counterfeit drugs. But Bertrand, you know, I believe, that the pharmaceutical industry would like to see the safe international online pharmacies go away too, and they would like to put pressure on the domain name system to do so. So in your first example, you said that's a completely legitimate site. So, you know, obviously there shouldn't be any action, but in this, on this other site, maybe there should be a one, two, three strikes policy. That kind of scared me. What, what, it, what, it, what do you mean by a three strikes policy? Would that, would that require a court order or how are, you, how are you viewing that? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Let's listen to the last question, and then we will see if you can summarize. What, we have one here. Here, on the other, this lady first. I want to say thank you, and I'll be quick. My name is Lori Schulman, and I'm from the International Trademark Association. So I do speak on behalf of brands. And I want to say generally, I, I agreed with a lot of what was said on this panel in terms of making sure there's newest approaches, due process, that the DNS is the last resort, not the first resort. And that, I think, sometimes in these panels where, where my members take issue is that there's the perception that somehow brand owners are going to the DNS first, when in fact, typically, they're not. There is an understanding that is a last resort. And I also would like to hear from the group and comment on a content-related question. You know, very fleetingly, we heard Thomas mention copyright. But it's very well known that copyright and counterfeiting, trademark counterfeiting online, goes directly to issues of child abuse. They're related to organized crime, human trafficking, um, substandard conditions, child labor. There are real social harms here, and we are a, a social community trying to find problems to solve the big, I mean, solutions to the bigger problems. So I would like to hear a little bit about how you, you reconcile that, because I do get concerned when trademark infringement and copyright privacy are, are looked at as sort of a sub-secondary to other concerns you have when, in fact, the profits from these activities online go to fund the harms that you're relating to in, in your four concerns. Oh, and I'm going to add one more thing in deference to my colleague Susan Anthony from the federal government. 
We agree that it's very important that the industry continue to talk to each other and to intellectual property owners and private sector businesses to come up solution with solutions as the debate goes on. And while the trusted notifier programs are one solution, another solution is also, we think should be mentioned, are verified registrant programs. That it is a, it could be very good, and we see this happening in CCs, and we see discussion online about uh, making sure that where people go to buy their domains is a trusted place, that the domain is trusted itself. And we see a lot being done on that front by URID with AI and predictive modeling on who may or may not be a registrant that will um, use a domain for not a legal purpose. It's controversial, it, it's, not, um, it's not even data tested yet, but there's some good results about predictive analysis of registrants who will use their domains as they should and, and registrants who will defy laws. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there a last question on this side? Please, very brief. Our time is over, and we'd like to see an answer. I'm going to read my question. Hi, I'm Pedro Perez. I'm here with UFIGF Brazil. Um, as some of you might have heard, during the last years, of, we've seen the emergency of some initiatives intending to decentralize the um, DNS by utilizing blockchain. Many of these projects did not succeed by varied reasons, but mainly because of this great ambition to disrupt the DNS entirely, breaking apart from ICANN. Um, however, I remember reading earlier this year about a project that intends to decentralize only the root zone file itself, not the DNS entirely, um, by utilizing uh, blockchain. Um, such a project is said to have um, many benefits such as increasing safety and strengthening um, resilience and avoid domain squatting. I was wondering, I, I know this, this can only like stir comments of a spec speculative nature, but I was wondering if you have any views over utilizing blockchain to fight illicit content. Would it be beneficial or quite the contrary? Thank you. Thanks. General, you would like to comment? General, some comments about the questions? In final remarks. Oh, we just swap. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, just really briefly, because I think others um, do want to also answer. Briefly to the question on the trusted notifiers, currently it's still being discussed even within the industry. It's really, really nascent right now. I guess what you can do if you want more information on it is you know, to come to us, to come to the mailing list, come to, come to ICANN, um, and, and discuss with us. But, but more, more importantly, I think the, the motivation behind that is we really want to stress that you know we are not the arbiters of content. We want to entrust it to people who are experts to recognize what okay this is you know child sexual abuse material this isn't etc cetera, etc. Cetera. We are not you know we're not qualified to do that. So that's probably the intent behind it. Uh, I think there were other questions that maybe other panelists are more suited to answer. Miguel, general comments. Yes, uh, very brief. Well, final. Uh, the, the last question, no, I don't... No, no, no. Oh, final no. remarks? No, no, no. No, 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 yes. <laughs> I, actually, it's a no. <laughs> no, I, I don't find a relation. Maybe you can uh, enlighten me on blockchain and fighting legal content through the DNS. If you, if you can enlighten me later, I'll be pleased. Um, no, no, or no. Thomas? <laughs> I'd, I'd like to, you know, there were so many points and we only have a few seconds left. Uh, to Laurie's uh, point, the reason why I made a distinction between copyright infringements and uh, child sexual abuse um, material is, let me illustrate this. Uh, I was uh, president of the INOP Association many, many years back, from 2002 to 2005. That's an international network where tips about illegal content are being channeled to the appropriate authorities. And we were thinking hard about what areas of concern could be tackled at the global level. And this uh, is sort of in line with, with uh, Bertrand's point. The, that is something where it's more or less universally accepted that it is illegal. Second point is that you can judge the illegality from looking at the content. While if you take a look at 
a movie or other la copyrighted material, you cannot cannot determine from looking at the content whether it's it's a it's a license licensee that offers the content or or not. So that is a it's a difficulty that warrants a different treatment of those of those contents. Also, uh, copyright infringement is not uh, copyright infringement. So if I sing a song or you know if I uh, come up with a song and, and that is being pirated, that is probably less of a concern than if Pink or some other global artist is, is being um, uh, is, is, uh, copyright is being infringed upon. Uh, and as I said, the constitutional rights need to be balanced against the rights of, of the network operators and others. And that makes it more difficult. That, it, that doesn't mean that I don't sympathize with the needs of this industry, but a different policy response is warranted. Manal, final comments? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, just qu again, quick comments and, and, and also touching on the question that came from our friend from Russia. Um, I mean, irrespective of the titles, if my boss is telling me take this thing down, I don't go and simply shut the server. I mean, I can tell them I have a better way to do it or at least <laughs> give it a try. So. The, the, if we agree that there is illicit content, then we should at least agree how to take it down. I mean, if we agree it's illicit, that, then the most important thing is to agree how to take it down. And I think there is um, still a lot to be discussed, but if, it, if there is an alternative, better way, I'm sure no one would... Uh, uh, would object if we're te uh, if we're telling them you have to contact X, not Y. No one would insist to contact Y, especially if this other route would be more effective in terms of results and more efficient in terms of time. So I leave it at this. Thank you, Paulina. You have comments? Here. Yes. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so I also would like to a little bit echo what uh, Laurie was saying um, uh, and. Um, yeah, I've, and references to towards uh, yeah towards towards the needs of the industry, but I have to agree with Thomas here that I mean I think investigation of the serious crimes that you mentioned should should be left for the for the competent authorities, and it's it's really not the responsibility of a registry to to and they are not even they're not able to to look at the content and see if if, if a if a pirated website is actually and if the revenues that they receive are actually uh, going to uh, fund. Uh, Human trafficking and or other um, or other illegal criminal criminal activity or not. So this is this is really just not the place. And another point I want to highlight is really is that I think the fact that we're having this discussion and we have this panel already shows that DNS operators, including registries, do feel responsibility to 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 take action to do something about this. And I think the some of the um, examples that uh, that I gave during my my introduc introductory remarks about the different approaches within CCTODs is a really it is an example of that. And Laurie mentioned URIT and their approach, and there are many many more. So it's it's really doesn't I mean it's really not that registries and DN DNS operators do not feel responsible. They do. It's just they also want to um, want uh, their role to be respected and also their remit to be respected and their technical capacity to be respected. And, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's my final remark on that. Okay, thank you. Now, Bertrand, very brief, please. <laughs> well, I've been well behaved. <laughs> um, quick thing, it takes two to tango. Sometimes when those things are being discussed, the spirit of cooperation disappears because immediately people retract in their positions and the mutual accusations fly. And this is not what is going to lead to the situation and the, and the cooperation. I'll give you one example. There's a thing we didn't have to mention here, but algorithmically generated domains is something that is necessary for botnets. We never talk about this. This is a major problem and we don't have legal solutions. That is the type of thing that needs to be, to be discussed. Uh, the other thing is, I don't want to forget the, the question that was asked before, the first one, without getting into details. The Digital Services Act and the whole discussions in the European Union are going to be extremely important. And I want to highlight, again, that I've done in many instances, including within the Environment of ICANN and the Program on Domains, pay attention to the discussions on the way on the 
e-evidence regulation that is currently in front of the European Parliament, it will impact the DNS operators, and it will impact, from the side, the whole discussion on WUHs. So it needs to be taken into account, and we need to, to, to connect that. And uh, finally, the question on transparency is a very valid one. Uh, this is something that has been discussed a little bit in the, uh, in the Domains and Jurisdiction uh, program last year. The question is, what are the good metrics? It's, and those of you who follow the uh, famous uh, discussion in, inside ICANN on the DAR system, reporting of abuse and having the information, numbers are often not sufficient. The question is, who responds to what? What is the due process that has been uh, adopted for, uh, for, for those things? And I want to highlight that one of the outcomes indirectly of the work that we're doing, and I'm very happy about it, was the presentation at, in Montreal of the, uh, the framework that a certain number of operators have begun to explore. And it's a first step, but it's an illustration of the fact that when you put actually the actors around the table, the governments, the operators, the big platforms, the civil society and international organizations, you can make progress as long as the spirit of cooperation is there. And uh, again, I hope that this panel will alleviate a little bit the need for the registry and registrar community to defend tooth and nail the fact that it is not the right level, which actually is preventing the discussions on the things that people really want to do together. Our time is over, but I will ask that Thiago, uh, the moderator, uh, co-organizer of this workshop, have the final word, try to have a remark, summarize. You have now time until midnight, no problem. <laughs> try to bring us together. Thank you, Professor. Of course, there's no time uh, for uh, concluding remarks or statement, but I would like to let you know that we will provide uh, a detailed uh, report summarizing uh, the arguments uh, and for each uh, of the policy questions discussed today and the potential impact on policy making to deal with illegal content online. And finally, uh, one an invitation for you all. Besides the topic discussed here today, uh, there are also other types of abuse that need to be discussed including uh, those that target the DNS protocol or subvert uh, the DNS lockup process, especially the attacks that subvert the DNS uh, lockup process are very concerning as attackers use a combination of techniques uh, to divert users' queries to malicious uh, DNS resolvers. And this and other types of abuse will be discussed Friday at noon uh, at the Open Forum number 48, organized by Melanie, uh, the Report and Analysis Center for Information Resources of Switzerland. So you are all invited to take part of that discussion. And uh, finally, I would like to, to ask uh, for a great applause to our uh, speakers on the stage and also for the qualifying audience on site and remotely. And thank you all for attending. Thank you for your patience. Ten, ten minutes over time. Thank you.